A very good morning, good afternoon, and evening to our friends from across various countries in Africa, Asia, and India. Welcome to this e webinar series. Today, we are having on the palliative care, the solutions we never had, effectively responding to this COVID 19 while strengthening our, strengthening our health systems. I am Dr. Pushkar Kumar on behalf of Public Health Foundation of India and Pallium India and Trivandrum Institute of Palliative Sciences Tips. I would like to welcome all our participants and our very esteemed global panelists to this e-webinar on palliative care, the solutions we never we had. We have today present with us doctors, nurses, clinicians, paramedical workers, and administrators from various African and Asian countries, as well as a large part of the contingent from India. We welcome all of you today. Uh, for all of you who are not aware, uh, Public Health Foundation of India, this organization was set up by Ministry of Health, Government of India. We are working in various aspects of public health. And our training division is running across 25 courses for healthcare workers, which we are running across length and breadth of India. We have trained over 32,000 healthcare work professionals, and these courses have spread to 12 countries, including several of our neighboring and Asian African countries as well. Government of Rwanda has also attended, has taken this course for training their healthcare professionals. And with Pallium India and TIPS, we have started a new course in certificate course in palliative care last year, and this is for the training of primary care physicians in palliative care. In India, the government of Madhya Pradesh has already adopted this training program and very soon we are going to launch it for the other primary care physicians across India. So coming back to the objective of today's webinar to inform and sensitize palliative care. Palliative care, as you know, is a specialized medical care for people living with serious illness. I will not dwell on this since we have a global panelist already available here to discuss this. So I'll go right down to introducing our eminent five panelists we have with us today. The first we have Mr. Harshwardhan Sani, who is a public health consultant based in Delhi, India. He is academically trained as a social scientist, worked on public health through knowledge management, research program design and implementation, and documenting innovations and best practices. As he worked in maternal, newborn, and child health and nutrition areas, he is a very new entrance to the palliative care, and his current work focuses on system strengthening using management research and communication tools. Uh, welcome, Hers, to this webinar. Uh, next, we have Ms. Joan Marston from South Africa. Uh, Joan is a full-time volunteer registered nurse. She has been a former chief executive of International Children's Palliative Care Network and also a co-founder for the palliative care in humanitarian aid situations and emergencies. She has over 25, 27 years of experience in palliative care for children. Welcome Joan to this webinar. Uh, we have Dr. Catherine Petters. She is the advocacy officer for palliative care at International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care and represents the organization at the global level who advocate for improved availability and rational use of rights for palliative care as a component to the right to health. She addresses the issue of global palliative care development and policy as an essential element of universal health coverage. And Catherine currently serves on the steering committee of the Geneva Global Health Hub. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you. We have next Professor Max Watson, an eminent author and eminent palliative care clinician as well. He is a director for Project ECO at Hospice UK and a consultant in palliative medicine, Western Trust. Project ECO, as you all know, is the extension for community health outcomes. Uh, worldwide, it is working on and all health people would have definitely heard of it. Uh, Professor Max has authored and edited numerous books, including the Oxford Handbook for Palliative and Palliative Adult Network Guidelines, and has taught and lectured extensively across the world. Welcome, Professor Max. 
and then we have Dr. Uh, M. R. Raj Gopal, who is the founder chairman of Pallium India and director for the WHO Collaboratory Center for Training and Policy on Access to Pain Relief, TEPS. Dr. Raj Gopal has been working for over three decades to integrate palliative care into health into healthcare in India. His advocacy contributed to the amendment of NDBS Act, Narcotic Drugs and Psycho. Tropic Substance Act of India in 2014, and he has been also instrumental in working for the National Program for Palliative Care by the Ministry of Health, Government of India, and sir has been a major contributor for this. So I will welcome all our participants and our esteemed panelists to this program, to this e-webinar series. Uh, just for a routine information, we have a chat box for any queries, if people have difficulty in login or any audio sounds, please message here. Our team at PHFI will be happy to help you and guide across. We also have a question and answer box, Q&A section, since this is a webinar and everybody is muted. So all our participants are free to raise their question and answer in this chat, a question and answer box. And we will, uh, our panelists, and we will be happy to take these questions after the first round of question and answer. So directly going to our first question for today, and I will take it to the very the newest entrance to this palliative care, and I'll begin with Hirsch. Hirsch, we typically equate palliative care with hospice and end of life care, but now we are hearing the buzz around palliative care in this crisis. Can you tell us more about this? Thank you, Pushkar. Thanks for that generous introduction. And thanks for underlining twice that I'm new to this space. So I will use that uh, newness to maybe talk about how I understood palliative care and how I have really understood over the course of the last year that it goes much beyond uh, end of life care. So jumping from working on public health with management consultants to a grassroots NGO, I did struggle with how palliative care defied a quick and comprehensive definition. Uh, the more I realized, uh, learned uh, to the patients and environment, however, there were some cornerstones that one could say that uh, palliative care addresses. First was caring for patients with serious health-related suffering. So there is a patient group that this uh, branch addresses. Secondly, very importantly, including their families in the plan of care, extending care beyond the patient to the environment, especially to the caregiver. And thirdly, treating the person, not just the disease. Hence, like addressing not just physical, but also like emotional needs, social needs, and uh, spiritual forms of suffering. So these start giving some shape of uh, palliative care for me. Another way I understood is that it is very specific to the individual. Every individual is unique. Their needs are unique. So rather than a template of practices, palliative care had principles, and that translated into different forms of care for different kinds of needs. The more I saw it unfold, I realized palliative care was essentially compassionate practice of medicine. It could be uh, providing essential medicate, uh, medication to mitigate uh, symptoms like pain, or maybe in the current pandemic, we should talk about breathlessness, we should talk about delirium, we should talk about agitation. Palliative care had the, the symptom management tools, and uh, I often saw things like pain went into the background while the disease kept getting treatment. Um, secondly, providing honest and compassionate counseling to the patient and their loved ones. So that was an essential part of practicing medicine, not just doing the treatment, but also dealing with the environment. And then when science and technology and medicine reach their limits, not fight death, but make dying dignified, surrounded by family, religious spiritual mentors, minimizing pain and regret in those precious last minutes. Uh, you did talk about that there is a buzz right now. So what do I make of that? So why is palliative care relevant now? The World Health Organization does count palliative care as one of the five essential components of comprehensive health care. However, it did take a global pandemic uh, that affected all of us, infected a few people, but affected all of us to see how essential it is. Nobody saw, uh, you know, nobody trained doctors to see so much suffering and mortality. Nobody planned to get so sick so suddenly. And nobody told loved ones how to get closure when you're witnessing suffering and deaths of those who are closest to you 
behind plastic shields and PPE from a distance. And these were very felt needs that someone needed to answer as the pandemic is uh, unfolding. So trained or not, world over doctors had to start practicing palliative care. They needed to have difficult conversations. They needed to uh, put the symptom relief measures I talked about into practice. And they needed to learn take care of themselves as well as families of uh, patients who died and had medical education, training, practice, prioritize palliative care, physical, emotional, social, spiritual weight of this pandemic. It might have been easier to bear for patients, for providers, for communities. Um, also, so that's laying out what was missing. But let's also talk about uh, what has been done and what can be done. I'll talk about at the individual community and systemic level. Um, we have participants from all uh, uh, strata, like you said. At the individual level, I think providers like doctors can learn about these skills and tools. Uh, you don't need to go to medical school uh, all over again, but uh, you can learn how to give essential medicines for pain from distress distressing symptoms like breathlessness, delirium, uh, pain and agitation that the pandemic we keep hearing about. Um, you can uh, offer counseling to, you can learn how to offer counseling to comfort the patient and family, build trust and understanding between those you're caring for. And you can offer appropriate end of life care and incorporate shared decision making principles so that medicine is not something that is done to the family, but the family participates in how the, uh, in the whole process. So, and there are short courses for this sort of stuff that organizations like uh, Pallium India run. Uh, interested people and all of us should be interested because the need there is a need uh, can participate in it at the community level we uh, common people we can uh, i'm not a clinical person so but we can educate ourselves about palliative care provisions we should learn about options available uh, if someone falls very sick or if someone falls uh, uh, near the end of life not just during the pandemic we'll have to face serious suffering in various forms throughout our uh, life course and communities can um, you know, become the link to such services once you know, your neighbors will know, your families will know, and so on. At a systemic level, compassion can be induced in big and small ways. Uh, in resource-constrained uh, health systems like ours, one touch point is medical education. Uh, at least I know we have an international audience, but I know about India. Uh, elements of palliative care were only introduced in undergraduate education as soon as, um, I think it was in 2019. And palliative care needs to be taught in totality. So along with the students, the teachers who haven't benefited from the curriculum to deliver such courses, they need to be taught. Um, at the policy level, palliative care is acknowledged in India. We hear about the program, we hear that it's a part of health and wellness centers, but people can take initiative to actually implement this in substantial uh, practice. And the same holds true for providing essential pain relief. Uh, if I talk about you, Pushkar mentioned about the NDPS Act, the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances or uh, Act. It was amended over five years ago, but many states are yet to implement the uh, amended rules. And the common man living with intense pain has to navigate so many barriers to get there. So that's something that if we have some systems level people here, you can take cognizance of the laws and provisions that exist and put them into action. Uh, finally, the topic is uh, the effect on health systems. How are we fight? using palliative care, not just to respond to the pandemic, but also to create a stronger system. This theory is well laid out in, uh, in our books. The initiatives to implement and practice coupled with awareness and demand from communities, this will strengthen our health system. Uh, my limited experience of working on scale and sustainability of public health endeavors, this has taught me that individual efforts matter. So if like a sub-district person in this audience is thinking what change it will bring about, it does have a ripple effect. You can be a beacon for someone else. So any one doctor can be a beacon when they incorporate palliative care in their practices. Uh, whole communities can learn from a single family that has benefited and whole governments can learn from best practices even like at a very local level and when these components synergize we will have a stronger health system one particular aspect uh, i would like to finish with is that when we care compassionately when we integrate uh, compassion into uh, our caregiving when we use shared decision making principles when we do compassionate counseling, the trust between the doctor and the patient, it uh, becomes stronger. And that translates into a stronger bond between communities and the health system. 
and when we work together rather than against each other which is often happening in uh, mistrustful situations our health system will uh, become more resilient thanks pushkar thank you harsh for laying the opening remarks explaining the palliative care and that this pandemic i think none of the healthcare professionals or the doctors nurses or anybody had come prepared for this magnitude but they have been able to across the globe i think they have been able to still fight this out and of course the palliative care become much more important now with the emotional spiritual social and other needs because it has to be individual centric and family centric as well and of course even in the education system in india this has been much of a new entrant maybe in 2019 into the education though we have a national palliative care program but in the terms of its importance it does come much below now in prioritization the health and wellness centers once it has been announced a couple of years back now so their focus is definitely there but in practice definitely it will take much time before we see it in practice so coming back to our next panelist we have ms joan master and joan my next question to you is how do you see the role of palliative care in an humanitarian crisis of this scale thank you so much pushka and thank you for your generous um representation of me and also to be part of this wonderful panel and harsh you may be new to the field but you gave a, a brilliant explanation yeah. of palliative care so thank you so much for that i think a lot of us feel that palliative care and humanitarianism is a fairly new field but actually if we go back in the history of palliative care we can see that they've been interrelated for quite a long time and so if i wanted to give you a short answer to your questions i would say we need to learn the lessons from the past and build on them and strengthen them we need to apply them effectively in the present and we need to plan for the future and 10 years ago there was a very good article telling us to plan as palliative care practitioners for the future and we should have heeded it and if we look at the interrelationship in our history as palliative care well we see the impact of world war 2 on cicely sanders who left university and became a nurse which was the beginning of her wonderful foundation of the modern hospice movement and elizabeth kubler ross who disobeyed her father and hitchhiked across europe after world war 2 to care for refugees so we already see this wonderful interrelation and if we even go further back we see the work of florence nightingale in the crimea and henri dunant who set up the red international red cross after sebastopol so we are very interrelated and if we look at the present picture of the humanitarian crisis even before we began 1% of the world's population it's a big number were in humanitarian situations and half of those were children so we need to remember the impact on children and 85% of them are in low and middle income countries most of which have rather fragile health systems i live in south africa which is quite a developed um elmic but we have a, a very um uh, impacted health system at the moment so of the 216 countries that are impacted by covid 134 are hosting refugees and we've seen that the need for palliative care has really been highlighted in um in this covid pandemic the un secretary general antonio guterres he called for the most vulnerable which includes refugees internally displaced persons women children of course those with disabilities to be cared for with extra care because they are most at risk um at 19 that came this year and i know catherine will speak more about it it calls for palliative care to be integrated into the covid response of every single country and so if we have this humanitarian crisis which was existing we have the present humanitarian crisis on top of it and we don't know the impact of this humanitarian crisis is going to go on for many years 
we can see this increased need for palliative care. So, but we, have, we do have lessons from the past. We see that palliative care has been integrated effectively into previous humanitarian situations. I lived and worked through the AIDS epidemic of the 1990s, early 2000s, where in South Africa, we didn't have antiretrovirals for a long time. And what we saw was a tremendous growth of the community systems. So we had civil society, we had faith-based organizations working together to develop a structure within communities. And the training of community workers, the growth of hospices across Africa, the involvement of faith-based organizations. We saw with Ebola, there were palliative care practitioners working in the field. And if we look at the Good Shepherd Hospice in Sierra Leone, they provided effective palliative care. But of course, we, we now have a big gap. So the gap that we have is that, yes, we do have some palliative care in humanitarian situations, but it's not nearly enough. We haven't done enough training. There's very little funding that goes into this field. And if we look at the humanitarian group, and we remember that both humanitarianists and palliative, palliative care practitioners, our main aim is relieving suffering. But in a humanitarian situation, the priority is always going to be saving lives. Um, but we also, apart from the activities we've seen, we actually have resources. So within the Sphere Handbook, which is the, almost the Bible of people working in the humanitarian fields, there is a standard for palliative care. We have a WHO guide to palliative care and symptom management in humanitarian crises. And we have an excellent field manual for palliative care in humanitarian emergencies. And when we went to Oxford University Press at the beginning of this pandemic, and we said, this is so needed, they very generously made it freely available online. Um, and of course, in India, you have the excellent Kerala guidelines that are being used actually across the world, especially in low and middle income countries. We have Medicine Sans Frontiers, which of course does incredible work and arose because of the Biafran War. Again, this interrelation, um, which has palliative care within their, um, within their policies. We have the Global Palliative Care Briefing Notes and Webinars, which are all effective in humanitarian situations. And we have the organization Palliative Care in Humanitarian Aid Situations and Emergencies. So you can see we do have resources. We do have palliative care practitioners who've worked in humanitarian situations. And we have seen the work of Dr. Bazana Khan, which as Paul Chase we have been supporting in Cox's Bazaar, working with the Rohingya refugees. And there she included the training of palliative care community workers and how effective that's been. But what can we learn from the humanitarian field? I think the big thing we can learn is that we can't be a separate part. We need to be part of a coordinated response. And I think the humanitarian response is probably one of the best organized of all responses. Um, of course, uh, the overarching response is coordinated by the Office for Co Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs. And then within that, you have the health, which is coordinated by WHO, children, by UNICEF, civil society, NGOs, and faith-based organizations. And apart from health, they're looking at safety, clean water, sanitation, enough food and shelter. So I think we need to learn from that. We need to be part of a big coordinated humanitarian support and a response. And there's so much that we can do as Harsh has highlighted. The work we can do with grief and loss. We have a worldwide network of hospices where people are trained in dealing with grief and loss. How do we harness that? And what coronavirus has really shown us is we actually live in a connected world. The right to health is a human right. It's a human right for everybody. It doesn't matter where you are and how old you are. So for every child and children need that extra special protection. 
And so I think we need a visionary strategy of how we include palliative care in humanitarianism as part of this whole coordinated holistic response. And we need to be planning for the future because we didn't expect this. We were caught off guard. We need to be organized and prepared. And we need to actually follow the advice of Henri Dunant who said to help without asking whom. So thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Joanne, for giving us the whole evolution of this palliative care and this, the status in this current pandemic. And of course, the effects on children who have been definitely affected. You gave the example of South Africa where the AIDS was also tackled quite good. And this crisis has definitely given us a lot of resilience to fight. Organizations such as MSF and various even whose spices is available across the globe. They are working together and we need to fight together to take a go ahead for this. My next question is to Dr. Catherine. Welcome now. Uh, Dr. Catherine, why is international advocacy for palliative care important and how can it help patients, families and practitioners at the bedside? Thank you so much um, for inviting me and for the great presentations that just proceeded. As Joan said, um, I thought Harsh's description of what palliative care is was one of the best I've ever heard. So thanks for that. I had prepared a couple of slides, so I think I'll show them just um, because it'll, it'll just help back up some of the things I'm going to say about um, effectively responding to COVID as per your, um, the title of the law, and then strengthening health systems. Those of you who know me, tend, know me tend to know that I tend to wander off a bit if I don't have um, a guide. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay. Um, yeah, please go. Yeah, let me make sure I do this right. Here we go. Um, there we go. Can everyone see it? Yeah. Okay, yes. super. So um, you've done my introduction, so I don't have to repeat that. Um, so I just want to introduce the organization I work for, um, which is the International Association for Hospice and Palliative Care. And most of the panel um, are members. I know Dr. Raj is a lifetime member. Uh, Dr. Sushma Bhatanga, the president of the Indian Palliative Care Association, is a former board member. And our vision is towards a world free from health-related suffering. Very simple and very clear. And our mission is to serve as a global platform to inspire, inform, and empower individuals, governments, and organizations to increase access and optimize the practice of palliative care. So this part I wanted to emphasize a little bit because it's what authorizes us to participate in international advocacy. We're a non-state actor in official relations with WHO and a non-governmental organization in consultative status with ECASOC, which is the UN Economic and Social Council. And that gives us the authorization to participate in these meetings, um, to talk to representatives of member states, and to work with the secretariat of those organizations to develop reports and documents and, and resolutions upon invitation. Um, we're governed by a board of palliative care practitioners from all over the world. <clears throat> Catherine, uh, would uh, you mind putting slideshow on? That'll be more visible. It, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm not good at this. Okay, here we go. Um, so is that better, Raj? Absolutely. Yeah? Thanks. Super, okay. So our advocacy seems is developing into to where we have two major components of palliative care advocacy. And one is that we have expert representatives of um, providers. So people who represent organizations such as IHPC, WHPCA, ICPCN, et cetera. And then we present evidence to help develop policy. We are representatives of providers and organizations. And then we also need the direct witnesses themselves to testify, the patients, the caregivers, the health professionals to present their experience because they're the direct 
experienced people, and they're also called consumers of palliative care or people with lived experience of palliative care. And this process is governed by law and regulations. As I said, we don't sh just show up at these meetings. We're authorized by a very pretty tight uh, application procedure, vetting procedure, accountability procedure to participate in the UN. Um, and IHPC works in all those multilateral spheres um, on international law, regulation, and policy of palliative care with our teams and representatives and members from all over the world. And this is the part I really wanted to focus on is the WHO Executive Board, because India is in a great position at the moment as head of the as president of the World Health Assembly Executive Board this year, uh, 2020 to 2021. Um, Dr. Harsh Bhadan, I think I said that right, the Minister of Health and Family Welfare in India was elected to be uh, the chair of the executive board, which has approved, as Joan said, several resolutions adopted by the World Health Assembly, including palliative care as an essential service. Yet, the member states of WHO have not funded their implementation. So the secretariat, the World Health Organization, the staff is working very skeletally on this, um, trying to develop indicators, trying to make um, medicines more available, but on a shoestring budget because they're not getting the kind of funding and support they need. So we're really hoping that um, the Indian colleagues can encourage Dr. Harsh to, um, Dr. Harsh Vardhan, yeah, um, to, um, to take up palliative care as a important uh, policy plank. And as we know, WHO is in a financial crisis right now, but we also know that palliative care doesn't have to be expensive. Um, so we look forward to India speaking up on this, and I'm pleased to announce that Dr. Sushma Bhatanga is, will be our advocacy focal point for India. The IHPC, my organization, has um, champions in about, um, we had six last year, and I think we're going to have five this coming year in Argentina, Australia, El Salvador, Kenya, Bangladesh, Chile, Colombia, Germany, and Zambia. And it's thanks to Bangladesh and Zambia and their advocacy that palliative care got into that resolution that Joan talked about, um, the response. So I just want to, this is my final slide, but I want to quickly talk about strengthening health systems with palliative care. Um, one of the main things to check on in your Indian health response is if civil society organizations are meaningfully, meaningfully, not just on paper, on PDF, included in the national response policy team. Because evidence on response and I've been looking at some interesting webinars on health systems out of WHO, is showing that many countries are sidelining health teams um, while prioritizing security in the economy. The ministries are not, and certainly not civil society is not being integrated, um, and certainly not affected populations. And we know that strong health systems can only come from effective community involvement in policy planning at all levels. So countries that neglect this element will emerge in worse shape with regard to public health than before the pandemic. You all know this, but the people at the top of the health systems don't necessarily know this, and they're focusing on security rather than health. So we can advocate in this pandemic showing that weak health systems are a security issue, as populations in poor health cannot withstand the pandemic, and they certainly can't have a strong economy. So all sectors need to work together. And I just wanted to say that, the, as Joan, Joan also said about humanitarian situations, that we do have the tools to do this. It's not like we're unequipped. There's an essential package that was developed by the Lancet Commission that's um, been included in Appendix 3 of the, re the how do you say, republished, the updated 
um, WHO guidance on clinical management of COVID, which was published on um, May 27th. Uh, so the, that's Appendix 3. There's a whole section on palliative care now in the WHO document. And then another tool that you may not know about that's on the IHPC website is a data platform that's been developed by the Lancet Commission and University of Miami that shows estimated serious health-related suffering that Harsh referred to in the first presentation for all countries in the world. And this, I looked at the map last night and the data platform for India, and the serious health-related suffering estimate for India is 7,272,000 and that people per year with serious health-related suffering. So almost 8, 000, 8, 8 million, excuse me, now that we have COVID um, because that was done over a year ago. And that includes serious health-related suffering from um, cerebrovascular disease, cancer, et cetera, 20 different health conditions. And then the, the data platform also shows the um, distribute, distributed opioid morphine equivalent, which Dr. Raj can explain better than me, which is the estimated percentage of serious health-related suffering met by the morphine equivalent. And in India, it's only met at 4% per patient in need of palliative care. So 43 milligrams of medication per year per patient. And finally, I just wanted to um, talk about compassion since Joan and Harsh uh, mentioned that, that compassion that's integrated at the system level creates what's called the beloved community. And I, that, that phrase is really resonant here in the States this week because one of our prophets of the civil rights movement died last week, uh, John Lewis who was a leader of the civil rights movement and was very inspired by one of your prophets. So Gandhi has been very much on the news here in the States for the last week and the word Satyagraha and um, the sole force in policy has been discussed um, this last week uh, in the States, which is great because John Lewis was so inspired uh, by Gandhi and his vision was the beloved community, which I believe that palliative care enacts uh, in, in practice from both the bedside to the highest levels of governance, even at the UN, because we can create and we are creating the beloved community. So thank you again very much for inviting me and I will end there and look forward to questions. Thank you, Catherine. And thanks for highlighting the role of IHPC as well as the WHO, which even India should take a lead now with Dr. Harshwardhan having been appointed there. And the need for advocacy of the palliative care you have very gently highlighted. And ultimately the health system strengthening, the availability of medicines, morphine and all are very important. So this has to be taken up. This pandemic, we have lost quite a few leaders, I think, and we'll have to remember their good works to take it forward. Uh, coming back to Dr. Max, uh, Max, my question to you would be, what has been the critical learning points of the palliative care community in the UK since this pandemic has begun? Since UK has been one of the earliest which was affected Definitely, we should learn from this. Max. Thank you very much indeed, Prishka, and thank you very much for the opportunity to participate today. Uh, I've learned a lot already and uh, really benefited from participating. I, I was going to take a little bit of a different line from some of my uh, previous uh, speakers and speaking just very practically and concretely about uh, the UK experience. I do so not because we did have done things so well, exactly the opposite. We have done things really badly. We are, as you can see by this uh, uh, little schema, there's been 45% excess deaths in the UK since the pandemic hit us. Uh, and that was at the start uh, uh, in, in March time. So um, a lot of more deaths and we have not done well, probably one of the worst countries in Europe. And so what I wanted to share was the three things. Uh, what, was, what was our early learning uh, as the palliative care community as, as we faced uh, 
uh, COVID, what have been some of the biggest challenges that we have faced? And, and as we look towards a possible second surge, what do we see as, as the key in, in our way forward? Sorry, Max, are you on slideshow? Yes, I am. Can you not see? Yeah, okay. Okay. Let's see, okay. I think, Max. Okay. Please okay. go ahead. Thanks. It's on slideshow. So in terms of uh, our early learning, when we, you know, we're anticipating, we were full of fear, full of worry, we got together and we created guideline after guideline after guideline. This was our response to COVID. Uh, it was going to be the production of paper was going to be the way we were going to defend ourselves. And very quickly, we discovered that paper didn't work. And actually, we didn't know very much about this disease and we don't know very much about it. So we had a lot of learning to do. Uh, and one of the things that we learned was actually managing the symptoms of somebody dying from a kind of acute COVID was not so difficult. And it was much smaller amounts of drug than we had anticipated. We observed three patterns of illness, rapid deterioration after day five of infection. Uh, and with those patients, they, 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 they didn't do well. And uh, but but they did their, their actual palliation from a physical point of view was not that difficult, and then there was the smaller number who who made it to the hospital were ventilated maybe for a long long time process, and that was very challenging emotionally and physically, and then there were our existing palliative care patients who caught COVID, and they were an, another really difficult group to look after because. Um, uh, our teams were pulling back from them, their needs were ever present, and then people were feeling abandoned and there was huge emotional uh, strain all around. We also learned really importantly, in palliative care, uh, if it's important to look after patients, it's equally as important to look after staff. You cannot look after patients unless you're looking after staff. And at the beginning, we didn't know what was going to happen so staff were really worried about working with patients and the PPE thing and there wasn't so much PPE available and all that strain and stress really really important to engage everybody in what we are doing be it the cleaner be it the caterer they are all as much open to ca catching COVID as anybody else so we had to change from a hierarchical model to very much a team model as we worked through the key issues and we were exposed by not thinking in a palliative care way as a health service because we started to protect one part of the health service and not protect another. And COVID doesn't know a difference between primary and secondary care. So when we discharge people away from our hospitals to protect our hospitals into care homes, the result you can imagine was disaster disastrous for the care homes. So we've got, as has been said already, no man is an island, no part of the health service is not connected to it. We've got to look after everybody. For our best challenges, they weren't so much the clinical, although COVID exposes us by each day by more and more ways in which it affects us. It is clearly a disease that affects the whole body, not just the chest. The big things that affected us were the ethical challenges of supporting our colleagues in their really difficult decision making and in our own decision making, looking after our patients. Who should be admitted? Who should get oxygen? Who should be looked after at home? Those were sort of our issues. And then balancing the needs of staff with the needs of patients, with the needs of family, with society's needs. You know, a need you know, to lock down. Yeah, lock down if you can afford lockdown, but what if you've, you've, you've got no money? Are you going to die from starvation? Are you going to die from the risk of COVID? And so you've got to look after people in a holistic kind of manner. And palliative care you know, really comes to the fore in saying that people need to be looked after as human beings. And in managing the uncertainty of this time, really important to work collaboratively together. No one has all the answers, no one has very many, but by working collaboratively together, we can at least maybe make fewer mistakes than if we work in isolation. Next big challenge was communication. Harsh already mentioned that. How do you communicate to a son that his mother is dying 
and he can't come to see his mum because she's in a COVID isolation ward and you're speaking down the phone or you're speaking in, a, in a, uh, an amber area with a mask on. This is very different stuff. Uh, how do you get around that? How do you demonstrate compassionate healthcare in such an environment? The big risk that hasn't been highlighted yet in terms of COVID is not just to the lives that are lost, but the potential damage to our humanity that we come through this having othered a section of the population. In the UK, we have seen people from particular ethnic groups uh, being much more effective, much more affected than others. We've got to look after each other or we we'll all suffer. And, and equally, until COVID is sorted out in Kazakhstan, it hasn't been sorted out in Kensington. We've got to look at it in a global perspective. So what do we see as the way forward? Well, Hospice UK, we've been involved from the start of March on, on weekly COVID update sessions. We have over 300 people joining us, the three representatives of the, the, the palliative community. As we work together, everyone a teacher, everyone a learner, working collaboratively, moving from the hierarchies of knowledge and power to this network model where we, we work through so that we don't repeat mistakes made in one area and we learn from each other. The use of virtual technology, such as uh, we're doing now, our, our platform is Zoom, uh, but our methodology is Zoom, is Echo. Everyone a teacher, everyone a learner, supporting, encouraging, building up, creating a safe space to learn. And we've seen the vital role of public health models of palliative care and India has taught us so much but we've realized that our own resources in the NHS are not adequate for what has we've faced uh, in, in COVID. Really important to share information and very quickly we managed to dispense with a lot of the, the, uh, the paperwork and the bureaucracy which so high banked the NHS and we, we started to do radical things like make it available that we could make drugs available for for relatives to give at home. We, 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 we moved it, it suddenly to, to be able to do that sort of thing because of the need that was there. I hope we won't go back to our silos of power again. And in terms of bereavement support, we need to work closely with carers. COVID is not just a medical problem, it's a humanitarian problem, and it needs to involve the human humanity as we respond to it. We shouldn't take control of it, rather we should participate in its management. Through our ECHO networks we've been involved in acute research, so uh, that has also been really important. So as we learn more, we develop new ways of, of dealing with things and new ways of supporting staff so that uh, we cannot look after others unless we ourselves are looked after. So the way forward and the way we see our future uh, as, we've pending, as we potentially face uh, a second surge, we need to anticipate, we've learned a lot, let's put that learning into practice, let's share that, let's develop plans for what will need to happen if COVID comes back again. These need to be communicated well so that we all know what is happening and we've seen models of that across the world uh, in New Zealand and in other parts and from a palliative care perspective we need to affirm that everyone is important and no one can be discounted and their symptoms physical emotional spiritual <coughs> yes that is our responsibility to work to help meet those needs with others. Thanks very much. Thank you, Max, for laying the whole ground, basically. How UK, you have learned from the 45 years that's there, the early no <laughs> learning of patients, staff engagement, the home care, care homes, and lockdown cannot be unlimited. Ultimately, the 
role of project echo to impart knowledge basically which is very equally important in this pandemic uh, coming to dr raj gopal <coughs> dr raj you have been a pioneer of palliative care efforts in india for more than 3 decades now what has been done what needs to and what can be done in developing country in a developing country like us pushkar thank you and uh, good afternoon and good evening and uh, good, good morning to the participants friends uh, yesterday we admitted a new patient to our inpatient unit she is a woman in her 50s with cancer she was living in delhi she was supposed to have radiation for the cancer that had spread to her bones from her cancer of the breast and then lockdown came the hospital closed its doors she went to other cancer hospitals nobody else was accepting new patients for them she was a new patient finally in desperation in july her husband sent her with her uh, young daughter back home to her home state of kerala she came to trivandrum was quarantined in a quarantine home we got this desperate call from a volunteer in delhi on her behalf and we found and we couldn't see her in the quarantine home but based on the records we started her on morphine next morning i rang her up to find out how she was i was hoping to hear that the pain was better but her cry was heartbreaking with the morphine she had some pain relief she thought but she couldn't lie down the whole night because the quarantine home had a steel cot with no mattress our palliative care on that day had to include the delivery of a mattress to her room well <coughs> she after four or five days her condition deteriorated she was transferred to the medical college hospital there her general condition improved she was uh, uh, put back on morphine and uh, things were better she was tested for covid after 10 days the result was still not found they repeated the test and finally being tested negative she was discharged last evening at 7 o'clock because they needed the room and we have admitted her in a lot of ways i think she summarizes a lot of problem of the covid affected people as her saying she is not infected with covid but in our world the 80% of the world the low and low middle income countries people are going through agonizing suffering with covid and a lot of people with any health condition poverty the poor access to care and to this pandemic i believe the health systems around the world are behaving in the way that is familiar to it with a disease oriented approach not bothering about the suffering testing treating the disease for which we know of no cure then make it organ centered eventually for people to die on ventilators we keep saying that health is physical social and mental well being and not only absence of disease or infirmity we have never bothered to put that into practice we have treated diseases we have not tried to provide health care physical social and mental well being and that's becoming so obvious in covid 19 what do we need to do like in that woman for the millions and millions of people who are suffering we need to look at suffering as a responsibility the healthcare providers responsibility is to mitigate suffering to cure sometimes to relieve often and to comfort always let me share a screen and i hope uh, that's visible to everybody 
the suffering is in all domains and in most of the developing worlds doctors and nurses have been not been taught in the basics of symptom control pain management or a treatment of any symptom we know that millions of people around the globe who have lost a loved one are in possibly in complicated grief pathological grief and we do not have a we, we have not bothered about them much we know that uh, the emotional consequences can be terrible and what this world will have to face next year something that we could do something about and all these elements of suffering include the question why did god do this to me needs to be addressed for which Harsh has already pointed this out. All three sides of the triangle have to come together alone cannot, alone cannot help. We need a policy, a facilitatory policy. The policy that World Health Assembly announced, World Health Assembly 73 announced in, on the 20th of May that palliative care has to be pro, part of COVID care. The policy that the World Health Assembly 67 announced in 2014, asking all countries to integrate palliative care into all health care from the beginning of the suffering. This policy needs to be accepted. I have a little more to say about the policy, but certainly that will be futile unless we bring in education and awareness. We are pr proud to say that our uh, organization working with Pali COVID Kerala has already trained some 350 professionals, healthcare workers in palliative care for COVID. But we need to get this out there as part of the government policy and access to medicines has to be facilitated. The laws have been changed in 2014, but the care homes do not have essential medicines. All these have to come together. And as far as policy is concerned, the concern is we have no money. We don't need a lot of money. Most of the things that we can do can be done at low cost, particularly if we bridge the gap between the nuclear family and the healthcare system by building in the MISO element of the social capital, the community. And that's what we did in Trivandrum. We asked for help. The day after the lockdown, we gave a press release asking for volunteers between the ages of 20 and 40. And in two days, around 100 people came forward. They, we trained them. They went out checking people's blood sugar, checking uh, people's blood sugar with a glucometer, delivering the medicines and helplines. We set up helplines so that we took in the calls. We gave all uh, calls to all patients that we registered uh, and now we are in the process of setting up a, a, a helpline starting tomorrow piloted tomorrow just for people from bereaved uh, families so that we'll be able to assess the, their complicated grief and help out as much as possible so let us if we address all these including in a policy decision to engage the community. If the government and healthcare institutions can be persuaded to accept suffering as a responsibility, and if we can engage the common man, not only ask them to help, but if we can welcome them, then a lot of the needless suffering can be alleviated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Raj, for highlighting the whole story about the palliative care in the times of this pandemic, from the shortage of beds to the health system approach and the need for this policy. The policy is both reiterated by WHO and various countries, including India. We have the National Palliative Care Program, where beds are allocated for even palliative care at the district hospitals, 10 beds as mandatory and going down below. But still, a lot needs to be done for the actual person down below who needs this, who's suffering. They should be provided this care 
so that they can access and for their family thank you and as we are our time is also getting short we have quite a few questions now in the chat box as well as in the q and a section so i'll uh, we have a question from i'll leave it open to the panelists whoever would like to take it and some questions are directed uh, we have a question from uh, but uh, parna basu there during covid 19 pandemic people who are not affected are also suffering from fear or uncertainty anxiety women and all physiological needs how palliative care plays a vital role in resolving the mental health problems especially the affected being separated from the loved ones shall i start yes sir certainly people need support the covid treating doctor cannot even uh, provide adequate a touch a touch to the person because of the pp most of the things have to come through the voice it can still be conveyed that we care for you and a lot and lot and lot more can be done over the phone somebody has to be it's only doctors and nurses now there can be social workers there can be volunteers with all the precautions that may sound revolutionary but that's essential they need to engage the people they people need time for their goodbyes and this has to be facilitated if we accept the question has so many questions and chat messages are coming in highlighting this point and that has to be accepted as a responsibility uh, so uh, setting up helplines every palliative care institution at least must set up helplines so that others will get inspired and uh, start giving more of uh, video conferencing and other means of uh, providing support uh, we have a question from silvia uh, addressed to joan uh, you have raised the humanitarian angle to this crisis so well something we tend to forget in our efforts facing this pandemic how do you think countries have fared dealing in this humanitarian crisis <laughs> that's really quite a wide question and i think it varies very much from country to country you know in countries where there are large refugee camps um some countries reacted very quickly and closed the camps and put into place um sanitation measures um and the numbers have been really fairly well contained but we forget that the majority of people who live in humanitarian situations are not in camps they're in the general population they either internally displaced they're refugees living in isolation or together with a large group and they are even more at risk because they're often living in poverty as well so the countries have varied very greatly in their response and the way they've managed it but in general i would say not that well thank you joy just sorry my internet connection just went off for a few seconds oh, okay <laughs> so i'd say in general the countries have not done a great job with people in humanitarian crises they have been adversely and in higher numbers affected by covid simply because of the poverty the living conditions um, but there have been some success stories in some of the refugee camps in greece nigeria acted very quickly bangladesh as well so it wasn't just high income countries um so it's quite a, it's quite a variety of responses thank you a uh, question for max uh, it's becoming very clear from this discussion about the need for us the medical community to step up and play a role where can we get access to training in palliative care in the current pandemic context that will allow us to manage our patients better in india and across I, 
I, I, I think I'm going to say something about radical. I think in, in part of the problem, we are part of the problem, palliative care specialty, in that we have got to recognize that dying is not a medical act. It is a human act. And if we are so proud of our profession, our specialty, that no one can die without us, then we're going to get in the way of a situation where we should be uh, midwives encouraging what is a human process. And I, I think it's so important that uh, as, as doctors, we acknowledge our weakness uh, and our inability. COVID has really exposed that. And it's in, it's in our humility that we actually have a chance of working in a much more uh, effective manner because we've got to engage with populations. Just me having my little palliative care clinic or seeing my five or six patients in the ward is not going to deal with the response. But if I can model an inclusive approach whereby I share knowledge, I share my expertise, but also I learn because most of our countries have been through this similar sorts of things in the past. There is, there is knowledge as people have grappled with infectious diseases at a community level. Why do we think that we should be the experts? There is much to learn and there's much to work on together. That collaborative solution is so much more likely to be effective than a hierarchical one decreed by from London or New York or some other such place. Thank you, Max. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Catherine. Uh, in a society where a lot of stigma prevails against the patients affected with COVID-19 and their contacts, how can we ensure implementing effective palliative care strategies for patients suffering from and recovering from COVID-19? I'm sorry, did you say that was a question for me? Um, this question is open, Mane, specifically it's tackling the stigma with the COVID-19. How do we implement palliative strategies to tackle this stigma? Because a lot well, of I, I would pick up on what Dr. Max just said, which is to model inclusion and um, acceptance and what everybody said. Um, to tackle stigma, we have to, in our own way that we practice, that we talk about it, that we volunteer, that we participate in the home, at the bedside, in advocacy, we just include and embrace um, patients suffering from that. But I think the clinicians, because I'm not a clinician, I'm a hospital volunteer, um, that, that they sh they're the ones who are working on the ground with patients. I know Joan is and, and Dr. Rogers and, and Max is, um, should answer that. But I, I think the answers we've had so far have been great. Could, could I mention just one thing that we did in UK? We created a charter right at the beginning of, because we, we didn't know what was going to happen, but we could at least commit ourselves to how we were going to respond to it. Uh, because at the end of this, we hope there's going to be a world that's worth living in, a world for our grandchildren and our children, uh, a world where there's inclusivity as opposed to lots of little people who have kind of guarding themselves and a very unsafe world. And I guess we've seen so much division in our world of late. Uh, we, we've, we've got to build a world which is worth living in for our grandchildren, and we do that by by modeling inclusivity and by being committed to realizing that we will only get rid of COVID for our own family when we've got rid of it from every family. Thanks Max for this addition. Uh, Hers, I'll take this to you basically. In this, uh, we have a question from Kellas. In this pandemic situation, how can we promote health status by palliative care? How do we promote the health status by palliative care? Hey, um, I'll just pick up from my opening remarks. It depends on who you are. Are you a doctor? Are you involved in the health governance system? Or are you a just a community member who could potentially get affected by this? 
as a doctor, there are tools we've learned from all panelists. The need is there. The tools exist. Uh, WHO has made them. Uh, advocacy organizations have uh, made them. You could learn and adopt them, or maybe your government has. I think we lost uh, Hertz for the line. Uh, we have a question for Dr. Raj. Uh, how is the excess of opioids influenced by the NDPS Act and also due to the COVID situation? Uh, Bushkar, uh, uh, I, I'll answer that question along with a couple of other questions, but more to do with the politics. Uh, okay, specifically, uh, NDPS Amendment of 2014 makes it possible for any government institution just to order morphine and use it. Uh, any other institution, according to the law, can easily access opioids. The problem is that 29 states and six union territories have not implemented the law after six years in full, or in majority of them, the old habits haven't died that's a problem. Implementation gap is there. Education. As Max said, every doctor has to treat pain and breathlessness. Palliative care professionals cannot go and treat all these COVID patients. And the psychosocial training, psychosocial support for the survivors, as Dr. Anne Mariban is pointing out, or for the families, who is going to do it unless we train the whole healthcare system in the basics, this cannot be done. Catherine found a solution. On the 20th of May, the same World Health Assembly meeting where all countries are asked to include palliative care into the COVID strategy. On the same day, our health minister, Dr. Harshvardhan, took over as president of the World Health Assembly. That recommendation from May 20, needs to be implemented. Maybe maybe if we approach him the right way, we haven't been able to reach him yet, but if we approach him, and if India should model the way as uh, to borrow the phrase from Max, and implements that, very basic online training for all COVID treating professionals. And very simple basic training for all counselors in the country who want to a lot of the suffering can be alleviated. And possibly the same strategy for engaging all healthcare providers, engaging the common man, that's the answer for any country. Thank you, Dr. Raj, for very exp explaining it very lucid way, this way. I think we had a few questions in the chat box also addressed to you. Uh, we have a question, Dr. Raj. Uh, the PTSD, basically a mental health problem during the pandemic of COVID-19. Can we include this under the palliative care during the period of lockdown? Absolutely. Certainly in palliative care, but it is, it is to be an essential part of health care. If we care for physical and social and mental well-being, as our, we accept it as a responsibility, it has to be any health care provider's task. Certainly palliative care people should take the lead, and we are setting up a helpline for this uh, as much as we can. It is uh, PTSD, a uh, lot of uh, pathological grief, so many issues, mental Ill issues and social issues need to be solved. And in our poor countries, how about food? What joke will palliative care be if we go and dish out morphine tablets when they have no food to eat? All that becomes, including that matters for my patient. These are basic needs, which can be done with the support of the community. Thank you, Dr. Raj. And we have a question directed at Dr. Raj and also Max. India is in the news with a rapid increase in cases. Have you experienced uh, have you experience of survivors yet? I am worried that we might have the post-psychoneurological symptoms which followed the Spanish flu. 
demonstrated in the book and film Awakenings. I cared for sister, two sisters victims of this in 1973 and they were bed first since 1919. Are we prepared? This question has come from Anne Merriman, basically. And, and, and is the political pioneer for sub-Saharan Africa and for the world. Uh, a mother figure for all of us and thank you. Uh, it's more of a challenge than a question. Are we ready? I don't think we are, but we need to be. We need to try our best. Um, we certainly haven't engaged COVID survivors yet. Our grief counseling system will engage them as much as possible, but that's a tiny beginning. Max, I think we need your words of wisdom on this. I'm not sure if I can speak after two uh, uh, champions of palliative care in the world, but in, in response to Anne, absolutely. We are seeing long-term sequelae. We, uh, I know a colleague of mine who was diagnosed with COVID back in March, he can still just about you know walk uh, there are a growing population of people with long-term problems we know the high incidence of post-traumatic stress disorder if you are admitted to icu uh, the, the strain the st increase in dementia increase in so many different areas yes there's going to be a very long covid tail and what wh what's our response to that I think uh, we can despair, uh, but one of, the, one of the benefits of COVID has been the development of these virtual communities of support. So hospices now in the UK, they, they don't have the ability to run day hospice, but they're doing other things. So one of their rehab uh, hospice work that's, that's just started has been in connecting up uh, patients with long-term uh, sequelae to COVID, connecting them up with volunteers who are there to support and encourage. And so we've got to think in terms of different ways of developing rehabilitation models because the traditional models are, are probably just too expensive and the volume of patients are too great. UK has, has created a couple of rehabilitation hospice, hospitals directly for COVID patients, but that's only going to be a smattering. We need to equip our health centers, our communities, our faith communities, our football clubs, bring them into the, into the knowledge circle of how do we look after people who are coping with the sequelae of COVID. And that sequelae may be the loss of job, uh, loss of finance, the loss of family, isolation, fear, all those things. We've got to reconnect with our communities. Well, in the UK, reconnect in, in many other places, that connection is still there. Uh, but that is the way forward for full rehabilitation, I think. Thanks, Max. Uh, Parna Basu has written for thanks, Joan Marston, and how to counsel the effect, affected being of the COVID-19 who is under compulsion, isolated from the relatives, deprived of the touch of love. Now, I think that a lot of this has been covered in the use of cell phones and iPads and that form of communication. But I think also something that Raj pointed out as well, you know, if even if you're in full PPE, it's the way you talk, it's the way you look, it's the way you use your body language. So you can still do that compassionate palliative approach, even if you are a bit, if that patient is isolated. But I think also we can use things like letters. You know, we've given up on letter writing because we do, we do emails, but people can write to that isolated person. They can send a little a flower you know, a cake, something like that. So I think we can still interact with them in a compassionate way. We just actually have to change the way that we do it. But I think we've got to learn to use our eyes, to use our voices, to use our bodies to show our compassion um, when we can't touch. 
Thanks, Joanne. I think we have covered, uh, we have some questions also in the chat box. Uh, one for Professor Max also. Excellent presentation regarding the post consequences effect of COVID-19 pandemic and the way you came out in giving palliative care for the patients, caregivers, also the complications that will be followed. Problems, the mental health, financial emotions, etc. Thanks. Basically, it's a comment because I think the post cardiovascular and mental will be felt as the, all the panelists have expressed today in the coming year also. It's not going away. Can I just pick up on what Joan was saying? I, I think we're, we, we've tried to discover or create some rituals to help us with the, the disconnect when families cannot be together. So one of the little things that we tried doing was, was pebbles, using pebbles with a, a, the, the name of the person uh, and the name of the family. So at the point of the hospital where they're, they're going, they're two different ways, they were each given a pebble to hold on to, a, a form of connection. I, I don't know what, what sort of rituals would be important, but, but having some recognition that you're not just a number, you're a mother who is now separated from her three children and her grandchildren, some, some concrete thing to, to touch, but really difficult um, because isolation is isolation and, and we've got to you know, preserve uh, that. So I, I, it's ways in which we, as a society, uh, acknowledge and say thank you to people for preserving that society by obeying lockdown, by putting up with the pain of not being with mummy, but helping in some way uh, and, and giving society <laughs> thanks in some way through ritual. Thanks, Max. And we also have a thanks and comment from for Dr. Raj Gopal, sir. Thanks for the reflection on the palliative care. I do rightly agree that today's scenario relies more on the treatment curative approach and then to the organic centric approach. Palliative care is totally missing in them. Pallium India Trivandrum has taken great responsibilities in training, volunteering the eff efforts of palliative care. Th thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that comment. Uh, several people have asked for information about training uh, for healthcare workers. And I have put upon the chat box something that Spriti had sent along, the link the link for accessing resources for palliative care, like the electronic guidelines, the webinars, and also information about the courses that we conduct every week. Yes, sir. And since all the participants have registered for that, we will share it, be sharing these links of Pallium India, the training programs, yes. as well as PHFI training programs to all of them, to all our participants who have enrolled for them. Thank you. And Pushkar, some people have also asked for sharing in the PowerPoint slides that were projected. Yeah, we will be sharing it. I think I'll request all the panelists to kindly share it with our team. Sure. The, we'll share the PowerPoints with all the participants registered. Uh, can I ask for some last closing remarks as we wrap up this, starting with Hers again? I hope technology doesn't fail me mid-sentence. No issue. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but thank you. This has been a very, very rewarding session. I think uh, I put some perspective and some uh, theory, if I may, to start with. And every panelist after me filled it with substance, with real lived experiences. I have learned that the tools exist the need is really felt, there is data around it, and that no one can work in isolation. So whoever you are, are you a doctor, are you a governance person, if you are a community person, there is a role you can play and take that power in your hands and do your bit because all of us are involved in getting affected by this and all of us will be involved in resolving this. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine, any closing remarks from your side? Oh, thank you for a very rich webinar. Yeah, just 
basically what so many of the people said about inclusivity and collaboration. Um, we, in advocacy, we need to create these cross-sector coalitions and not just remain in a palliative care silo. So that means connecting with organizations of older persons, communities with other conditions, um, persons with disabilities, uh, the development community, of course, the faith community is absolutely key of um, all of them um, to create a, a, a new community, uh, which is a palliative community, a kind of palliative citizenship, and again, the beloved community. So thank you very much for inviting me. It was wonderful. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Joan, any closing remarks? Thank you so much, and I agree. It's been a wonderful webinar, and thank you so much to the panelists and to all of those wonderful questions. So I'd just like to say that the right to health that includes palliative care is a human right. And that right must be extended to everyone from that tiny little newborn baby till the person who's over 100. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether you're a displaced person, whether you're someone living through a humanitarian crisis, or whether you like most of us living at home at the moment, um, we need to fight for that human right for everyone. So thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Joanne. Uh, Max? Just repeating, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity of participating. I guess in summary, for me, it, it comes down to this. We would want the care for everyone that we would want for our own families. And I guess there's been talk about training for palliative care, and yes, that's really important. But most palliative care begins in your heart and in your desire to see in the other family someone you care about. And it's in that approach that will ensure that we will get the knowledge and the skill and the, uh, the expertise that we need to meet the needs of those round about us. What an opportunity uh, that we have to be palliative care people. Thanks very much. Thanks, Max. Uh, Dr. Raj Gopal, the last to you. Unmute, Dr. Raj. To any, you are muted, sir. Uh, I, I hope it's okay now. Sorry about that. To any healthcare provider in the audience who is no, who has not been exposed to palliative care so far, I would only request that some basic learning is essential in all healthcare. So please try to access available resources. Palliative care is not rocket science. It's more about humanity uh, incorporated into science. Uh, that learning is absolutely essential. If we are to be more than medical technologists, and if we become true healthcare providers. And to anyone else, said non-healthcare providers in the audience, I would say that every one of us has a role to play. Maybe to reach out to somebody in isolation over a telephone call, some support. Please let us not hesitate. They need it. And give information to people. This is something we can, all can do. So much of stigma against people affected, against families affected. It's so sad. And all because of the sensationalist reporting in the media. We need to compensate for that by giving out proper information. But thank you all very much for the very active discussion. And my fellow panelists, I have learned so much from you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Raj. And a big round of thank you to all our panelists, basically from Joan, Catherine, Max, Hers, and Dr. Raj. Uh, thanks to Smriti Sylvia from Pallium India, Manoj, Dr. Sandeep Palla, and my team at Pallium PHFI. And thanks to all our participants who have joined from, I think, for some it's morning, afternoon, and evenings, because I am seeing from Rwanda, from Indonesia, Jakarta, and across India, we have participants from across the globe who have sat down and joined this ex extremely useful webinar. and the need to extend the palliative care information to all of us. A big thank you to all of you and we'll be sharing the presentations 
and the training programs as dr raj has mentioned both the phfi and the palem india training programs the links to all of you thank you very much and namaste from india side bye thank you bye bye everybody bye everyone bye, bye. thank you bye, bye rod thank bye you. Joan. bye man bye catherine bye, bye. 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 Thank you, Pushkar. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pushkar. Thanks, you. Thank you so much. Uh, Vishnu, we can.